Okay, well, thank you and welcome to the Rolls-Royce M250 familiarization, maintenance and troubleshooting tips. Okay, so to start with, I'll just talk a little bit about myself to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ron Guillaume. I'm based in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. I've worked at Standard Aero for 20 years and I have uh, about 23 years experience in aviation. I am a licensed a and mechanic with a power plant rating. I currently work as a Rolls-Royce M250 and Safran Ariel field service rep and a Rolls-Royce authorized course, course instructor. I also support Rolls-Royce for any issues arriving on new engines delivered to Bell Helicopters plant in at um, Bell's Mirabel Quebec, Quebec manufacturing facility. So if you have any questions about this presentation, you can forward the questions to my email address at ron.geal at standardarrow.com. Okay, so I'll just talk a little bit about Standard Arrow, who we are. So we are one of the world's largest independent MRO pro providers and are a proud member of the Rolls-Royce M250 First Network as an authorized maintenance repair and overhaul center. We first opened in uh, 1911. Standard Arrow has over 50 years of experience with the Rolls-Royce 250, and we provide OEM approved engine and overhaul accessory repair and overhaul with uh, service locations in Canada, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, in Richmond, British Columbia, and in the US in Concord, North Carolina. Also, we have a service center in Singapore. So we have a, an extensive engine and accessory exchange pool. We have engine and module rental pool. We provide 24 hour AOG field service and tech support. And we also offer Rolls-Royce approved engine maintenance courses. So on the, the bottom here, you can see this is a picture a few years ago of our, of our overhaul shop in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And on the right hand side, you can see this is a photograph of our overhaul shop in the, around the 1970 era. So first of all, a bit of a disclaimer. So information taken from the standard or webinars are not to be used for determining engine or component serviceability and are not to be used as a manual supplement. The engine or component can only be released to service based on approved data. Procedures shown in this presentation are not intended to replace or contradict approved maintenance procedures. Always follow the applicable engine or airframe manual procedures. Participation in the webinar does not constitute any type of certification or accreditation of the procedures shown in the presentation. Uh, the contents of the video are subject to change without notice. And the information in this webinar is the property of Standard Era and or Rolls-Royce Corp Corporation and may not be copied or communicated to a third party or used for any purpose without the express written consent of Standard Era. Okay, so let's uh, get into it. So just first of all, a bit of familiarization on the engine. So a basic description. So the Rolls-Royce M250 engine is classified as an internal combustion turboshaft engine featuring a free power turbine. The engine consists of four basic sections, a compressor module in the front, composed of either a combination axial centripetal, centripetal compressor. This is a C20 model showing. So this uses a combination axial centripetal compressor. Uh, on the bottom here would be a schematic of a series four module. On the series four, you would have just a single entry centripetal impeller. And uh, either in either uh, model, this is coupled to a turbine section that uses a two-stage gas producer. So there's a two-stage gas producer and a two-stage power turbine. <clears throat> a reduction gearbox is mounted in between the compressor and turbine sections, which incorporate a, a gas producer gear train, an N1 gear train, and a power turbine gear train, an N2. The combustion section, uh, using a single combustion can, a single fuel nozzle and igniter is mounted at the rear of the engine. The free power turbine refers to the fact that the two-stage gas producer and the two-stage power turbine rotors are not mechanically coupled. Okay, so just a few applications, engine applications for the turboshaft. 
Um, so one would be a Bell 206. So that would be like for a C20B engine or C20J. Uh, we have the MD, some MD models would carry it, the 520 model, 530 and 600. Uh, the Augusta 109, which is a twin engine variant and the Bell 407. So this is just a few of the applications for the uh, model 250 engine. There's also a turboprop model. Uh, so it's also produced a turboprop version and this is only in the series two engines only. So only in the C20 series, there is a turboprop model. So in this application, a prop box is attached to the gearbox, which is used to drive the airplane propeller. It can be distinguished as a turboprop by the prop box mounted to the gearbox. Also, the exhaust stacks are pointing downwards. So most of the helicopter applications, the uh, exhaust is in an up configuration, but um, uh, the, in the turboprop version, the exhausts are pointing down. Okay, so engine sections. So the engine is divided into four sections, uh, the compressor section, the gearbox section, the turbine section, and the combustion section. So th only three of those sections are considered to be major modules, meaning compressor, gearbox, and turbine. The com combustion section is not considered to be a module. The combustion section components are simply considered to be part of the engine assembly. It is a modular engine, so individual components, individual mod modules can be swapped out and changed. So just an overview of the fuel system. So what we're talking about here is non-FADEC engines. So the uh, smaller series, the C20 series uh, and C30 would use a pneumatic mechanical system. Uh, the air source comes from the compressor. So compressor discharge pressure is routed to the fuel system to operate it. The principal components are the fuel pump, the gas producer fuel control, the power turbine governor, and a single fuel nozzle, which is mounted at the rear in the combustion section. Okay. So now, um, now we're looking at the FADEC version. So newer models, so uh, C30R2, um, C40 and C47 versions will use uh, a FADEX system. Uh, now this, this goes up to the new C47E model. So this version, of, there is a new FADEX version for the C47E E4 models. So the FADEX system is a fully electronic with a simple hydromechanical backup system. It powers three civil applications, the Bell 407, the Bell 430, and the MD-600. Uh, it also powers several military applications. Okay, just a overview of the lubrication system. So the lubrication system is a circulating dry sump type with an external reservoir and oil cooler mounted and furnished by the airframe manufacturer. There are two magnetic chip plugs. One is located on the right front side of the gearbox housing under the oil out Port, and a bottom plug located on the bottom of the gearbox. So on a C20 series engine, you would have one, the top plug would be mounted here just under the oil out port and the bottom plug mounted at the bottom of the gearbox. And this example of a C30, uh, it's in the same location, uh, just below the oil out and the bottom plug would be located at the bottom of the gearbox. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a bit about some inspection and maintenance tips. We're gonna talk about fuel system and combustion system. So fuel nozzle service. So per the operation and maintenance manual, the fuel nozzle shall be cleaned as part of the 100 hour inspection. Cleaning can be done with a nozzle assembled or disassembled. Fuel nozzle cleaning may be necessary at more frequent intervals, depending on you know, your operation. So you want to inspect the screen. So uh, collapsed or buckled screens are cause for rejection. Uh, there was an AD that talks about screens that had collapsed due to fuel contamination. So there is a newer style one that's uh, more robust. 
So to disassemble it, you would insert the fuel nozzle body in the um, part number 689-7875 folding fixture. Uh, then you would unscrew the outer air shroud. And if you don't have this holding fixture, you could put it into a uh, vise with soft jaws, but just you know, be very cautious about that. Uh, you don't want to over tighten it because you could distort the body. So you want to carefully remove the spray tip assembly from the outer air shroud and the filter from the body. No further disassembly is permitted. So basically, you want to uh, split it into these four components. And this, is, this example is a series two, a C20 nozzle. Okay, so for cleaning the nozzle, you, you would suspend it vertically in a, an approved carbon cleaner, such as Bruin safety solvent, number 512M or equivalent. Uh, you want to flush the nozzle internally and externally after carbon removal with approved solvents. You can use a soft bristle nylon brush, such as a toothbrush or something, to remove any carbon buildup. You want to ensure that carbon does not enter the spray tip. So the, the actual fuel spray tip is actually the two orifices in the middle here. The outer parts, these are actually just air coming out of here. And you want to dry with a soft cloth. Like uh, we'd recommend using a low lint cloth such as Kim wipes uh, to avoid getting residue inside the nozzle. Uh, you don't want to use a cloth that's going to have, you know, the fibers coming off of it or something. So you want to use a lint free uh, cloth to wipe it and do not dry it with compressed air. Um, if you do blow air, you want to blow air uh, sideways and at an angle towards, uh, you know, the exit was the exit of those holes because obviously the purpose is is if you were to blow air in here you could actually lodge some carbon or something into these spray nozzle tips and block them. Okay so now uh, we're talking about this fuel nozzle spray pattern. <clears throat> so um, what you want to have you want to have a nice uniform spray pattern here because you want the fuel to be uh, coming out in a nice fine mist so that the fuel can atomize properly in the combustion chamber. What you don't want to have, you don't want to have these voids in the, the spray pattern and have these streaks. So the streaks would be basically higher concentrations of fuel, which can cause local hot spots. So I have a couple of short videos here. Uh, one is of a fuel nozzle as received. So when I play the video, you'll see that there is some streaking going on here. You'll see it kind of, it's rotating. So you'll see the, the streaks moving. So if you just look in this area here, you'll see the lines where it's streaking. And then the one afterwards, it's gonna show you after it has been cleaned. So I'll play this first one. So you, if you look there, you can see this is, this is a uh, fuel streaking there and you, you're gonna have these voids. So that's what you wanna try to avoid. Uh, so this one definitely needs to be cleaned. Okay, now the video beside it, this is the test after it was cleaned and overhauled. So right away, just looking at the picture, you can see that it's a much finer mist than that, but I'll play it for you and you can see the difference. You can see that's much more evenly distributed and stuff. And you want the droplets to go in, you know, as a fine mist so it can atomize properly. Okay. Okay, so what are the effects of a fuel nozzle that's streaking? So the purpose of the fuel nozzle is to atomize the fuel and evenly distribute it in the combustion chamber. Over time, the nozzle will start to develop carbon buildup. When this happens, the distribution of fuel will start to become uneven. This streaking will create local hotspots which can cause premature burning or wear on the combustion components. So here is an example of the effects of a streaking fuel nozzle on a number one turbine nozzle. More frequent fuel nozzle cleaning would have prevented this damage and will reduce the overall operating cost in the long term. As the old saying goes, you can pay a little now or a lot later. So, you know, better to clean your fuel nozzle more often than to have a problem with streaking. And, uh, you know, if you look at this fuel nozzle, you can see this is the trailing edges of one of the, the veins in the number one nozzle. You can see it's just completely burned through and cracked. And uh, a lot of times what you'll see when it's streaking is you'll see a hot spot in one area and then 180 degrees from that, you'll see another area that's all burned up. So 
obviously spending a, a little bit of money just to clean the fuel nozzle more often um, is cheaper in the long, much cheaper in the long run than having to replace this number one nozzle. And not just this, but you can imagine that if this damage was here, you can imagine there's probably more damage upstream and downstream of it, perhaps in your liner or further down downstream into your number one wheel, number two nozzle, and through the turbine. I went too fast there. Okay, here's another um, another slide showing this is example is a series two a, a C20 inner combustion liner. So this also shows the effects of a streaking fuel nozzle. So you can see this area here, the liner is totally distorted and bulging, and it's basically just cracked all the way through. So the uh, the flame would be sitting right around here. So you know, the flame would be coming right through, right through the inner liner. So that would be heat damage to the, to the liner. Okay. Now we're talking about the outer combustion case. So the liner fits inside of this. So inspection of this is part of the 100 hour inspection. So per the Rolls-Royce operation and maintenance manual, visually inspect the outer combustion case. Uh, you wanna inspect the sheet metal and weld seams for cracks. Uh, pay particular attention to the weld seams in the area of the igniter. So you're looking right at the back here. So you have the fuel nozzle mounted in the center and you have the igniter mounted on the, just beside it there. So plugs, dummy plugs, drain valves, fuel nozzle bosses, armpit braze patch and adjacent areas. You want to inspect them using a bright light and mirror as necessary. Uh, for the inspection, the OCC does not have to be removed. If you're inspecting it while it's installed, then the engine must be motored, not running, and checked with leaks with leak tech. So um, if you remove the OCC, it would be inspected as per the NDT method. So here we're looking at cracks in the armpit areas. So you can see there's a very large crack here, and you can see um, this was probably operating in an erosive environment. So inspect using the leak tech or fluorescent penetrant inspection method, uh, all the designated areas, no cracks are allowed. Any outer combustion case that is cracked must be removed from service and repaired or replaced. There is a customer service letter, um, a CSL, and these are the numbers for these uh, customer service letters for the different models. In that service letter, it, it, uh, it, there, it gives you a link to a video and uh, the video will, will show you the procedure on how to, you know, motoring the engine, where to apply the leak tech, where to look for, uh, you know, for any cracks or any leaks like that. So, so now we're going to look at lubrication system maintenance and troubleshooting. So we're going to start by talking about some the engine oils, approved engine oils. So approved oils for the 250 series engine must conform to mil spec uh, 7808, 23699, the 85734, or the AS5780 specifications. Uh, refer to the operation and maintenance manual for a, a complete list of brands and suppliers of approved oils. So on the bottom here, these would be some examples of third generation HTS oils. So here's approved oils for different temperatures. So if you're above uh, 40 degrees Celsius and above, uh, you would want to use the 236.99 or the AS5780 or the 7808, etc. If you're below uh, minus, uh, minus 40, well, first of all, you better have a nice heavy jacket on. Uh, but uh, you would want, in that case, you would want to use the 7808. A mill spec. So because of availability, decreased coking and better lubrication qualities at higher temperatures, the mill spec 23699, which is HTS, which means high thermal stability, or the AS 5780 HPC, which stands for high performance capability, either of those oils are preferred for use in M250 engines. So as modern engines become more powerful and operate at higher and higher temperatures, the use of these HDS oils becomes more important. 
So now we're looking at uh, checking the oil level, adding and mixing of oils. So you wanna check the aircraft oil quantity within 15 minutes of engine shutdown to avoid a false indication of excessive oil consumption. If the 15 minutes has been exceeded, motor the engine for 30 seconds with the starter before checking tank quantity. Be sure to refer to the airframe manual as some have a different procedure. So mixing of oils is permitted without any time penalty, only if the oils are of the same series. For example, different brands of third generation of HTS oils. So use of mixed oils from different series, meaning if you, are, you have a, a third generation oil in your engine and you need to put in, uh, say for example, you're, you know, you're somewhere remote and all you have is a second generation of oils, that would be a different series. So the use of mixed oil from different series in an engine is permitted only in an emergency and is limited to five hours total running time during one overhaul period. Maintenance records must be kept to ensure this limit is not exceeded. Operation in the engine over this time limit can result in engine failure. So they take that pretty seriously. So if you're changing to a different brand of oil, it is recommended that this change be accomplished gradually using the top-up method or by completely draining and refilling. So the top-up method is done by gradually adding the oil as it is consumed. So some engines consume very little amounts of oil. In this case, the top-up method can be accomplished by draining small amounts and then adding new. So to decrease the likelihood of carbon being dislodged when changing over to the third generation of oils, these changes must be made when the engine is new or repaired to the point that the lubrication passages and sumps have been cleaned and flushed. So for example, if you get your engine back from overhaul, all the internal passages uh, in, inside of the, uh, the gearbox and throughout the engine would have been cleaned and flushed. So in that case, you can, you can change over from second generation to third generation. So you want to check the oil filter after the first 25 hours for carbon particles if the, the type of engine oil has changed. Keep checking every 25 hours as required until the carbon, carbon accumulation stops. Okay. Now a few tips on changing oil. So of course for best results you want to drain the oil when it's hot. So assure that the oil is removed from the oil filter cavity before removing the filter. So you would remove the filter cap and you would use a syringe to draw the oil out of the um, oil filter cavity. Once that's drained, then you can pull your filter out. So there is an O-ring. Uh, so the filter goes onto a standpipe and there is an O-ring that goes at the bottom of that standpipe. So when you take the filter out, just be sure that uh, you see that O-ring on the bottom of the standpipe. Sometimes when you pull the filter up, the, the O-ring will stick onto the bottom of the filter. And of course, be sure to install a new O-ring before installation of the filter. Sometimes it's, um, they forget about um, the, uh, the O-ring there and, um, or they'll, they'll forget to remove the old one and then they'll go and they'll, we, we've seen some that have been installed with actually two O-rings. So, so just be uh, careful with that. So after that's done, you want to fill the oil filter cavity with oil. You want to assure the airframe oil tank is clean before refilling with approved oil. Uh, to assure flow, please uh, first remove the number one and number eight scavenge lines. You want to motor the engine with the starter uh, using no fuel or ignition, of course, until there is an indication of oil pressure and you see oil flowing from the scavenge lines. So once the lines are reconnected, you wanna run the engine at idle for at least five minutes. And during that time, you wanna closely monitor oil pressure. Um, if oil pressure is lost, uh, you would shut the engine down immediately and investigate why. Okay, so now we're gonna look at some troubleshooting tips for some of the common problems. Okay. So lubrication troubleshooting. So we're talking about oil consumption, smoking, that sort of thing. So the oil consumption limit for all Rolls-Royce M250 models is one quart or one liter for every five hours of operating time. 
So as long as you're below that limit, you're within the oil consumption limits. Smoking is a result of oil leaking into the turbine gas pass. Uh, if you have smoking after shutdown, it could be caused by a uh, number five bearing carbon seal, which is um, mounted just uh, inside of the bore of the exhaust collector, uh, or the labyrinth seal. So the C20 models would have a um, mechanical carbon seal that's spring loaded. Uh, some older C30s also had this configuration, but most of the newer C30s, all of the C40s and 47s will have a labyrinth seal for the number five, not a, a magnetic uh, carbon seal. So in either case, you want to look for any um, puddling of oil at the bottom of your exhaust collector. Uh, normally the labyrinth seals don't give as many issues as the carbon seals do, but you can still have a problem there. So smoking during operation could be caused by carbon buildup within the turbine scavenge struts. So inside the, where you have your external sump, that scavenge strut, if that starts getting blocked up with carbon, then what's gonna happen is that oil is not going to scavenge out of there. It's gonna back up and it's gonna go into the gas path and, and create um, uh, smoking. Uh, it could also be, perhaps we've seen it before where these, these struts have, uh, have cracked so the oil going through here will go through the crack and then into the gas path. So you do have to do a, uh, a flow check uh, as part of an inspection and you wanna ensure a minimum of, of 90 cc's of oil flow out of the power turbine scavenge strut. Um, if you, smoking can also be caused by a weak scavenge pump. So if the scavenge pump is not drawing the oil out of here, then you're gonna have the same symptom. The oil is gonna back up and it's gonna get into the gas bath and create smoking. So if oil is found, so that would be uh, this area here. So if you see oil found at the inducer exducer port, which is this area here, uh, the, the exit of the bleed valve or the compressor inlet areas, it could be caused by oil leakage past the number one bearing carbon seal area. So these are the areas you wanna look for. You wanna look at the impeller blades, you want to look at the, eg the exit of here. Now, normally if it's coming out of here, this is going to be attached to a hose, which is going to go to the top of the cowling, and you'll see oil spilling here on the top of the cowling. So this would be an indication of a leak at the number one seal area. It could be the seal itself, or um, there has been issues with uh, the front supports cracking. Um, it could be a cut O-ring or something like that. Now we're talking about oil venting. So oil may also vent rather than burn. So this will show us more raw oil in the cowling or the, so you might see some oil here on the cowling or on the tail boom. So this can be caused by a defective gearbox breather vent seal. So on the C20 models, there is a port on the side of the gearbox just above the starter generator. And there's a hose attached to it and it routes up to the right side exhaust stack. So if it's venting oil, you're gonna get oil venting out of here and then it will come out of your right side exhaust stack and onto the cowling. Now to replace this seal on C20 models, you do have to, you would have to remove both modules and you have to actually open the gearbox. On the Series 4 engines, C30, C40, 47, you can replace that breather seal without splitting the gearbox open, although you do have to, you still have to remove the turbine and compressor modules. Or it could also be caused by an improperly sized compressor vent orifice, or also could be caused by higher than normal internal gearbox case pressure. So if the internal pressure in your gearbox is too high, even if the seal is, is uh, still working properly, that extra pressure is gonna push the oil past that seal. So now we're gonna talk about metal and oil troubleshooting. So um, if you, let's say you have some um, metal deposits in your oil. So which plug is accumulating metal? Is it the top plug? Is it the bottom plug? Sometimes it's both plugs. So how do you determine where the uh, the problem may be. Okay. 
So if we're looking at the top magnetic plug, so this normally would collect metal particles generated by the compressor number one bearing. So if it's coming from the number one bearing, um, or if it's coming from the number six and seven bearings, where the external sump is, or the number eight bearing. If it comes from, um, if it's coming from those areas, typically you'll see that on your top magnetic chip plug. So um, sometimes if you have metal particles inside the gearbox and it is not, or, or the number two, number five bearing and number two bearing, sometimes if it is not picked up by the bottom plug, it will be also collected by the top plug. Now for the bottom magnetic chip plug, this normally would, would uh, collect any metal that's coming from this area. Would, so your number two bearing and number two and a half bearing would be here, also your number three. Um, your number four bearing, which would be in around this area, number five bearing, which would also be when the turbine's mounted, it's right here. So any of those bearings, if there's metal coming off, it's gonna fall down into the bottom of the gearbox and be collected by the bottom chip plug. And of course, any component in the gearbox, if, it, if, there is, if it's generating metal, that metal should go down to the bottom. So sometimes what can happen is, is if you have a lot of metal um, you know, in, inside your gearbox, uh, that metal will accumulate on the bottom plug. Well, if there's a lot, that will sort of saturate the plug. So basically, there's only a certain area amount where the metal can collect on the plug. So if that gets saturated and fills up, what the there's no longer any more area for the plug to attract the metal so in that case the oil would flow past that and would not be collected by that if that's the case it, it should be also picked up by the top plug because as the oil is is exiting the engine all the oil in the engine has to pass by the top plug as well so if it's not captured by the bottom plug it should be captured by the top plug as well and that's also why you you can see it on both plugs even though your problem only originates in one area. Okay, so now briefly, we're talking mostly here about, um, you know, the uh, 250 engines in general, all the models, some of the, the um, maintenance procedures are specific. So this is specific to C20 series engines only. So the C20 uses a combination axial and centrifugal impeller. Uh, so, uh, at every 1,750 hours, um, there is a, an inspection we do of the case halves. So we would remove the case halves and we do an inspection there. Okay. So as per the Rolls-Royce Operation and Maintenance Manual, the compressor case shall be inspected every 300 hours when operating in an erosive and or corrosive environment. So it is as required in a modern, in moderate environment, but never above never more than 1750 hours. So erosion of the case plastic and veins robs the engine of horsepower of performance. Erosion and corrosion can lead to vein failure, which can lead to engine failure. So visual inspection for corrosion and plastic erosion is easily performed once you remove the case halves. Vein erosion inspection must be done through measurement. Okay, so here's an example of a removed case half. So you can see the plastic breakout. So it has a, a plastic that's uh, injected onto here. And that's like a sacrificial coating. So uh, you can see that the, uh, there's been extensive cracking in here and parts of the plastic have broken out. So that's a good example. So that's gonna really rob, it's obviously the compressor is not gonna be working as, a, as efficiently and it's gonna rob you of, of uh, performance. So standard aero has a, um, a plastic that we apply, a product we apply, we, it's called the Enduro Coat 3500. So over time, cracks initiate at the root of the blades of the compressor case due to thermal cycling. So as the cracks grow, they propagate towards adjacent cracks, eventually causing plastic breakout. So our Enduro Coat improves plastic adhesion, which reduces the propagation of plastic cracks. It drastically reduces corrosion of the base metal, which also contributes to plastic breakout and minimizes downtime lost and money spent for operators. So 
if you see here, um, they did some testing, wedge crack testing. So with um, the original plastic, uh, the industry standard, you would start having breakout like this. With standard as enduro code, it's much more durable. It, it, it's um, the, the the plastic basically uh, adheres better. And then also with some results after seven days of salt spray testing. So the industry standard, you can see the um, at the bottom of the uh, the base of the blades here. You can see the result, and you can see the result with standard as enduro code. It's much improved. You can see just small traces of it, but it's much improved. Okay, so for inspecting the veins themselves, so you want to measure the thickness of the vein. So you want to measure it near the root of the vein, right into the middle there, as they show here. So this would be uh, dimension T, and each stage would have a specific uh, thickness. Okay, so how do you actually measure this? You know, you think it must, it would be hard to measure. So the tool we use would look like this. So we would go in here and we would measure the thickness of those veins individually. So that's what we would use and we would measure them to make sure that they're within um, the minimum thickness. Okay, so here's an example of a case hab with some veins broken out. So you can see a couple of veins here that are completely broken out. This is at the sixth stage, the last stage. So you can imagine uh, these these pieces would have uh, gone, this would have gone from here, it would have gone through the impeller and through the discharge tubes back to the combustion section and then forward through the, the turbine and out the engine. So you can imagine these pieces could cause quite a bit of damage downstream to there. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about uh, power assurance checks and train monitoring. So, you know, power assurance checks are something that's done um, quite often on these engines. So we want to look at that, okay? So first of all, sort of back to the, to, to the basics a little bit. So how does an internal combustion engine produce power? So it produces power by converting thermal energy contained in the air and fuel into mechanical energy used to drive an output shaft. More heat in the combustion chamber means more thermal energy and naturally more power. You know, you could compare this to your furnace at home. If you put in more fuel in your furnace, the, the flame is gonna be hotter, which is gonna create more thermal energy. In the case of the turbine energy, the turbine engine, we are converting that thermal energy into mechanical energy. So if the engine can produce a given power setting at a lowered measured gas temperature, it means that it is more efficient at converting the thermal energy. Okay. So what is a power assurance check and why do them? So a power assurance check is a check to ensure that the engine can produce a given power setting without exceeding a specified measured gas temperature limit. So a power assurance check, if passed, verifies that the current engine performance will allow the helicopter to meet all performance criteria stated in the flight manual. So when the flight manual says when a helicopter is at a certain gross weight with a certain altitude and outside air temperature, the helicopter will safely lift off and the pilot will be able to maintain control. So if we perform these checks on a regular basis, we can use this information to monitor the overall engine health and to be able to track the rate of power degradation. So when, when do we need to perform these power checks? So although there's often no set flight hour requirements for doing these checks, performing them on a regular basis is good maintenance practice to ensure the engine is meeting minimum power requirements uh, tracks power performance degradation and avoiding surprises which may cause unscheduled removals for repair. Uh, different operators make it a policy to perform these power assurance checks at regular intervals, some every 25 hours, some every 50 hours. If your engines are susceptible to foreign object damage or if you're flying in uh, erosive environments, uh, so if you're susceptible to foreign object damage as when there is not any kind of particle separator or filter on your intake, um, it would make the FOD damage more likely. So it'd be a good idea in this case to do them at even shorter intervals. Some may decide to do them after each flight. 
Now I know uh, some some airframes have uh, you know they have systems that will automatically do these these power checks. So this would be ex an example on a Bell 430, which uses two C40B engines. So this would be in the in the flight manual. This would be an example of how to do the the power check. So you would put the engine being tested at full open. The other engine would be at ground idle. So you want to start with the collective fully down. You want to turn off the particle separator purge. Uh, you want to turn off all sources of bleed air, heater, and environmental control systems. You want to turn that all off. You want to maintain your N2 and NR at 100%. Your generator loads 30 amps or less. And then you would increase collective until lights on skids or in a hover. So you're on the Bell 430, you're not doing not normally doing the power check in a, in a forward flight. You're doing it either right on the skids or in a hover. And you do not want to exceed these parameters. So 92.9% torque, 779.4 degrees Celsius MGT, or you do not want to exceed 105 MNG speed. So once you do that, you want to stabilize the power because the settings are going to the read is going to fluctuate a bit. So you want to let it stabilize between one to four minutes. And then you're going to record the pressure altitude, the outside air temperature, the torque, the MGT, and the NG speed. So the procedure is the same whether or not snow deflectors are installed. Only the chart readings will be different in those cases. Okay, so Standard O has a power check uh, program. Uh, there is a desktop version and there is a there's an app you can download on your phone. So sometimes um, if you use the, uh, the, the graph that they give you in the uh, flight manual, sometimes when you're doing your power checks, the, you know, the, uh, your settings will be sort of off the chart. So if you use the, um, the power check app, you would just, just basically put in your parameters and it's going to calculate automatically for you whether the engine is passes is, is above specification or below specification. So, um, so the app can be downloaded free. This is the desktop app, it can be downloaded free from our website. So if you go to our website and you go to the Rolls-Royce M250, you'll see a, a red link here for PowerCheck app. So if you click on that, you can download that app, the desktop version on your uh, desktop computer. Or if you go um, on the App Store, you can get the mobile version of it. So just go into the App Store and look up Standard Aero Power Check, and it should bring you right there, and you can download it free of charge. Okay. So here we have, uh, this is actually the Power Check chart for a Rolls-Royce 300, uh, which is, goes into the Robinson R66. So I use this chart simply because the, um, you know, the space in between the, the graph is, is a little more spaced out. It's a little bit easier to read than some of the other graphs. So we're, we're going we're gonna to do this old school and show you how it works so you can see when you, because with the uh, power check app, basically just putting numbers in, you're putting input and it's calculating it for you. So we want to understand exactly what it's doing here. So how to go through this chart is, so they put in one example for you and we will do one example together. So what you want to do is you want to enter the chart of the observed torque. So in this case, it is 83%. So you want to enter the chart where it is at 83% torque. You want to read down to the pressure altitude, which is in this case was 4,000 feet. Okay, so you draw a vertical line down to 4,000 feet. Then you would draw a horizontal line over to the outside air temperature, which was 10 degrees in this example. And then if you draw straight down, uh, it brings you to the um, MGT reading. So what this is telling us is, is this is going to determine the maximum allowable MGT. So what it's saying is, is that at this power setting, that altitude, et cetera, all, all the parameters, the MGT should be a maximum of 650. So, so we'll do another example together here. So the pilot came back and he said that um, he gave you, he did some power checks and he gave you some readings here. So we're going to plot this onto the graph. So he said the engine torque was 
So we're going to enter the chart just before the 80 here. And his pressure altitude was 6,000 feet. So we're going to draw a vertical line from 78 down to six, where it intersects with 6,000 feet. Then he said his outside air temperature is five degrees Celsius. So we want to draw a horizontal line to where it intersects with five degrees Celsius. And then from there, we're gonna draw a line straight down. And this is gonna tell us what the maximum allowable MGT is at that power setting, which is, looks like it's just over 640 degrees Celsius. So the pilot was actually saying that um, his indicated MGT was 660. So it was actually in this area here. So if it was 660, then um, this would be a fail because uh, basically his engine has to operate at a higher MGT to produce the same level of power. Okay, okay so that's how you interpret it. Now let's look at the app to see what the app came up. So if I bring up, this is um, the phone app. So I, I took this off the phone app. So basically you'd go into there, you would put in your airframe combination. So R66, airframe option. There may be different options here, like a basic inlet or with uh, a particle separator or a, a filter. Then you wanna put in the parameters that you, you observed. So in this case, 78% torque, 6,000 feet, five degrees Celsius and what the pilot observed, which was 660 degrees. And then you would calculate this. So you calculate it. And what this telling is telling you is, is that the maximum allowable is 641. So we were at 660. So this would be considered below specification with a margin of, we, we were running at a 19 degrees higher than what is allowed. So this would be below specification. Okay, so some factors that could influence power checks and trends. So one is variations in pilot procedures. So different pilots may have slightly different procedures on how they do their power checks. So it's important to, you know, to tr train the pilots to make sure they're all doing it consistently. So you're gonna get consistent results. So to eliminate variables, the operator should aim to perform the power checks at the same pressure altitude, the same torque pressure and the same airspeed. This will also be beneficial to achieve accurate and consistent trend monitoring. So it's important to also wait for the indication to stabilize before recording, because sometimes this, the, the uh, readings will uh, fluctuate a bit. So you wanna wait till those stabilize before recording them. You wanna make sure you use a proper chart, meaning um, with or without filters, uh, snow baffles, particle separator, et cetera, because if you have an inlet filter on, it's gonna affect the airflow into the engine. So that's gonna have an effect on how it calculates power. So performing in hover as opposed to forward flight, that can be different too. So depending on forward speed, the ram effect may come into play depending on your intake configuration. Outside air temperature reading has a big influence. If there's a tailwind hotter than ambient air coming from the exhaust or engine cowling, they cause erroneous readings. So to assure accurate trend checks, the aircraft configuration must remain the same during the flight, the first and each subsequent check. Okay, so now we're gonna look at some factors that could in, in, influence the power checks also. Uh, so you have to make uh, consideration for tolerances on the accuracy of the aircraft installed instruments. So instrument error could affect the performance by approximately 4% below actual power available for every plus five degrees Celsius error in outside air temperature. So you wanna use a precision mercury type thermometer in the immediate vicinity of the OAT probe. Uh, shade both thermometers for a minimum of 15 minutes before taking a reading. And you wanna compare the accuracy of installed outside air temperature gauge. 1% uh, below actual power available for every 300 foot error in pressure altitude. Uh, determine the pressure altitude by averaging the readings of the altimeters of known accuracy on the flight deck. 2% uh, below actual power available for every plus six degrees Celsius error in MGT. So of course you wanna check the calibration of your measured gas temperature system and your gauge. And 
2% below actual power available for every plus 2% error in torque meter. So you want to check the accuracy of your torque meter reading. So why do we do the trend check monitoring? So the trend check analyst provides a method for the operator to monitor engine health. The trend check will also allow the operator to more efficiently predict when preventative maintenance is required and schedule some maintenance actions that were formerly unscheduled. So performance trends are identified by plotting power checks on a graph. So we take each of these individual power checks and we plot them over time on a graph and that will give you a trend. So trend checks can be used to monitor the health of an engine on a day-to-day -day basis. However, trending is best used to determine the engine health over long, longer periods of sustained operation. So you can see how the power is degradating over time as the engine wears. So a ch trend check program can be initiated at any point in an engine's life. The effectiveness of the trending program is dependent on the quality of the incorrected data. Anything that causes the in-flight data to be in error will reflect adversely on the effectiveness of the program. So of course, if you if you're putting, you know, in, if you're putting the wrong inputs into a calculator, for example, it's going to calculate the wrong output. Okay. So now we're going to look at a uh, a line, a trend line of normal power degradation over time. Now, in in reality, in real life situations, the the line is most likely not going to be linear as linear as that it, it is it will fluctuate up and down a little bit but in general what you'll see is uh, on the bottom here you'll see the engine hours as it wears and on the left side you'll see the degradation so this would be the tot increase so basically they're going to take the power check readings and um, they are going to plot these individual readings on a graph over time so for example, you can see this is when the engine is new. And as the engine wears, so the engine is at 200 hours of operation. So as the engine wears, the MGT readings are going to increase. So as you know, because the engine is not operating as, as efficiently because it's wearing, the compressor is not able to pump uh, the same amount of, of uh, air to the back. Um, the the uh, MGT temperatures are going to have to increase basically to produce the same power setting. So you'll see those will increase over the life of the engine. <clears throat> and then they will kind of stabilize a little bit as it goes along. So, uh, but like I said, in real life, you won't really see it quite as, as even and linear as that, but uh, a general trend, you want to see it uh, going up in, a, in a, a normal fashion like that. So degradation is also affected by operation in erosive environments, excessive operation at high temperatures or over temperature conditions and other abnormal conditions. So the more erosive the environment, the longer the higher temperature was maintained or the higher the over temperature, the faster the performance will degrade. Degradation due to this type of abnormal operation could appear as the trend line depicted below. So if you see that your engine, your MGT is going up at quite a high rate, then this would be uh, an, an example of an abnormal operation. So uh, maybe you're, you're flying it in an erosive environment. So the engine is basically degradating and wearing faster than it should be under normal conditions. Okay. So now this would be a performance recovery from a compressor wash and rinse, or it's also known as a gas path cleaning. So short-term degradation can be caused by operating the engine in a contained atmospheric conditions. So if you're operating dust, smoke, and other industrial contaminants can cause this type of power loss. Aircraft oil leaks when they mix with the air entering the engine can also result in loss of power. This type of degradation can take place in minutes or hours and is generally corrected by rinsing or washing the engine. So following the engine rinse or wash, it is normal to report that power would return to the previous baseline. If power is not recovered following a rinse or wash of a dirty engine, another problem is indicated. Note that the engine performance does not return to the original baseline power available when the engine was new or overhauled. So you'll see they were doing trend checks of uh, power and you'll see that the MGT was going up. And so basically the compressor was getting dirty. When the compressor gets dirty, 
um, it's not going to be uh, working as efficiently as it was designed to do. So at this point, they would do a compressor wash after they did the compressor wash and they did another power check. They found that they recovered some of that lost power. Now this won't obviously give you more power. It will just recover any loss that the engine had due to dirt buildup or something like that. So it will repeat itself like that. So anytime you do a wash, you can recover that power loss. Okay. Now this line would show you, um, so if, if you're doing your power checks and you see a sudden increase you know, from one day to the next, let's say you did a power check and your MGT was a certain limit, the next day you did another one and all of a sudden your MGT just jumped up. Well, this would be an indication of a mechanical problem or something. So engine components which are in the process of failing can also appear as a short-term degradation. So when engine performance degradates over a short period of time and rinsing or washing the engine does not recover the performance loss, a component failure or misadjustment should be investigated and corrected. So following maintenance, it would be normal to expect that the trend line power would be recovered. So this type of component failure or loss of adjustment could appear as in figure 18. So you're going along, one day to the next, all of a sudden you see a jump there. So this could be due to uh, from a FOD or something like that. And then after the uh, repair was performed, then the, uh, that would be a recovered that. Okay, so now here's an example of some power checks and trend records. So this is one, from one of our customers. So as I was saying, so each, each of these colors here uh, represents a different aircraft. So you can see that like I said, the line is not linear. It will go up and down a little bit, but the purpose of this trend checking is to, you know, to check the overall degradation of the engine to see how it is wearing over time. And by using that, you can predict if there's any unscheduled repairs that will need to be done or something like that. So that's just an example of what that would look like. Okay. And then, so if you have uh, some, uh, low power issues or something, um, or any kind of troubleshooting issues in the operation and maintenance manual, they do have a troubleshooting section. And so you would go to the appropriate symptoms you have, in this case, uh, low power or high MGT. And it will give you some examples of what the uh, problem might, might be. So as you can see, first of all, it would be a dirty compressor. So it would say, clean the compressor, do another power check afterwards. Foreign object damage, Repa replace compressor if damage exceeds limits. Uh, excessive air leaks, you wanna repair any leaks. Uh, you know, we talked about faulty indicators, so a faulty M MGT indicator, uh, faulty torque meter indicator, a faulty outside air temperature indicator. Any of these you want to calibrate or replace. If you have an uh, anti-ice valve leaking, uh, that will cause an air leak, which can cause a power degradation. Uh, faulty torque meter indicating system. Uh, any other air leak in the engine from the air discharge tubes, leaking at the piston ring split seals, um, cracked air discharge tubes or cracked um, outer, outer combustion case. Uh, also uh, compressor rotor to shroud clearance excessive. Now this is not something you can adjust uh, in the field, this is something that's um, it's uh, adjusted when the compressor is built. We would we would adjust the uh, the clearance between the impeller um, impeller profile and the shroud that goes over it. So um, again, outer combustion case cracked. Uh, first stage no nozzle, if it's cracked or if it's eroded or anything that changes the shape of the airfoil in a you know, in a nozzle or something like that is gonna affect your performance. A turbine wheel or nozzle eroded uh, excessively, so you would replace, obviously. And warped or cracked combustion liner, so you would obviously re repair or replace that. Okay. okay, so that brings us to the end here. So I wanted to thank you very much for, uh, for, for listening and participating. And again, if you have any questions um, for me, you can email me at, my email address, which is ron.geal at standardarrow.com. So thank you very much and have a good day.